school graduation is this Thursday, May 25th at 6 p.m. And uh, there's information there that the new teachers um, are already on board and we'll be saying farewell to uh, Mrs. Stalkop and Miss Maddie who will be leaving. And Bible studies pastor is still, still going, right? Yes. We still have our Bible studies. And Sandra does have an announcement. Regarding the Lutheran Witness magazine, if you would like to receive the magazine and don't receive the magazine, come see me and we'll get you on the list. If you receive it and do not wish to receive it any longer, I will take you off of the list. So we're updating the list for that. And that can get mailed directly to your home. So, I like I like it. It's good. So yay or nay, see Sandra. Any questions? And butter braids, Pastor, do we? Yeah, so butter braids, I think, uh, I think they're going to deliver next week. Uh, I'll bring everybody's to Messiah and throw them in the fridge or put them in my freezer. So I'll gather them and I'll let you know uh, when we have them available. And I'll bring them to church for you. Any other announcements? Yes. It's coming. Thank you. You almost had me ready to sign up right there. <laughs> well, I think we have um, any other announcements. I think we have everything we need for worship today, Pastor. Thank you. Uh, just a couple other things from worship perspective. So on June 4th, uh, we're going to have a service to recognize. We have one graduate from uh, high school this year, Bell. So. We'll be celebrating her graduation on June 4th, so please, please come and attend that. And uh, uh, next Sunday's Pentecost, so we're going to tra start transitioning to what I call the green season. So after June 4th, uh, we're going to have what I call an interactive service. We're going to have two Sundays when the sermon is going to be interactive. So if it flops, I'll take all the responsibilities, but you guys are my guinea pigs. So I think it actually it's going to be kind of fun. And what we're going to be discussing is we're going to actually be discussing about how calls us to, to, to mentor and minister to our inactives. And there's a purpose with this, because with the leadership and the elders, we're going to start trying to reach back out to inactive members who haven't been in church for quite some time. And the theory being is that, you know, we train and we teach how as a congregation we can minister to those people as they come in, so that's the purpose of the study. It'll be two Sundays in a row, so stay tuned for that. Uh, I think other than that, uh, prayer requests, I think. Do we have any prayer requests this morning? Um, I added Weston. Weston's uh, uh, a young man or a young boy that actually attends our preschool over here. He had a health situation, so we're going to pray for healing for him. But uh, we are also going to continue to pray for Roy, Jim, Jeannie, Stetson, Greg, Katie, Miranda, Hazley, Rindy, Elida, Vicki, Klaus, Ray, Judy, Cindy, Helen, and Carol. Is there anybody else we need to lift up today? Yes. Okay. Anybody? Yes. Lana and her husband Tom, they recently suffered some losses, and oh. uh, his dad recently just had a stroke, so he's in the hospital. So that's a father in law. So did they have a, did somebody in their family pass or? Yeah, Lana is eight months. Okay. And another family member. Okay. And it's for, for Tom's father that needs healing? That's sick? Yes, it's Lana's father-in-law. Oh, okay. Okay.
Okay. Anybody else this morning? Okay, well, God has something to speak to us today. Today is our last Sunday where we're doing a study of the Acts of the Apostles. Um, I'm not going to, I'll speak a little bit to the, to the, uh, uh, to the uh, first reading in Acts, but it's all going to be generated around Peter and the, and the Epistle lesson. And uh, the, uh, the text, that, the, the topic is we're going to be looking at Rich in Christ's Grace. So uh, stay tuned for that. Um, and I think with that, I think we're ready. No call to worship. Ding. We're ready. So in the meantime, uh, as we transition into the green season and stuff, if anybody has, you know, I've been always preaching a lectionary, which is fine. But if you would like to do a little bit more in-depth study of one of the books of the Bibles, let's say, you know, maybe Galatians or one of the epistle lessons, let me know. Because we could actually do a little bit more in-depth study on that if, if you would like to. So just a, you know, just a little information for you. If you have any wants on, on maybe some studies, please let me know. Okay, great. So I think we're ready for worship. So we'll start with the call of worship. We continue with song. We begin the service this morning in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He, he is, is risen, risen indeed. indeed. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs, with thankfulness in your hearts to God. Pay careful attention to yourselves and to all the flock in which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to care for the church of God, 
which he obtained with his own blood. Obey your leaders and submit to them, for they are keeping watch over your souls as those who have to give an account. Let them do this with joy and not with groaning, for that would be of no advantage to you. And he gave the apostles, the prophets, the evangelists, the pastors and teachers to equip the saints for the work of the ministry, for building up the body of Christ, until we all attain to the unity of the faith and to the knowledge of the Son of God. Hallelujah, Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Let us confess our sins to God our Father, confident that he will hear and forgive us for Jesus' sake. Most merciful God, we confess that we not always been proud to bear your name. At times we crumble in the face of the trials that come our way. We know worries and anxieties to crowd our caring presence. Keep us in your name, which you have given us in baptism and forgiving us our sins for Jesus' sake. Our God hears our prayers and forgives our sins because of Jesus' perfect life, death, and resurrection. At the command of Christ and through the power of the cross and the empty tomb, I therefore forgive you all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Go in peace. Hallelujah. Amen. We continue with the reading of the psalm. I will sing of steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord. I will make music. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. I know that the Lord, he is good. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pastures. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Glory be to the Father, and to the Son, and to the Holy Spirit, as it was in the beginning, is now, and will be forever. Amen. I will sing of, stead of the steadfast love and justice to you, O Lord, I will make music. Lord, have mercy, Christ, have mercy.
like to invite you now to share the peace of the Lord with others here this morning. Now, you know, if some of you guys sat closer up front, we wouldn't have that log jam in the back of the church, would we? Huh? <laughs> All right, thank you for that. All right, I ask the congregation to please rise. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. O King of glory, Lord of your church. You suffered on the cross and defeated death and the devil for us. Make us one as you and the Father are one. Unite us with you and as your, the church in suffering and celebration that the world may see by dawn that you the power of the resurrection. For you are risen and reign eternally with the Father and the Spirit, one God now and forever. Amen. Now you may be seated as we continue with the reading of God's Word. The first reading is from Acts chapter 1, verses 12 through 26. Then the apostles returned to Jerusalem from the mount called Olivet, which is near Jerusalem, a Sabbath day journey away. And when they had entered, they went up to the upper room where they were staying, Peter and John and James and Andrew, Philip and Thomas, Bartholomew and Matthew, James the son of Alphaeus, and Simon the zealot, and Judas the son of James. All these with one accord were devoting themselves to prayer together with the women and Mary, the mother of Jesus, and his brothers. In those days, Peter stood up among the brothers. The company of persons was in all about 120 and said, Brothers, the scripture had to be fulfilled, which the Holy Spirit spoke beforehand by the mouth of David concerning Judas, who became a guide to those who arrested Jesus. For he was numbered among us and was allotted his share in this ministry. Now this man bought a field with the reward of his wickedness, and falling headlong, he burst open in the middle, and all his bowels gushed out, and it became known to all the inhabitants of Jerusalem, so that the field was called in their own language, Akadama, that is, field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms, may his camp become desolate, and let there be no one to dwell in it, and let another take his office. So one of the men who have accompanied us during all the time that the Lord Jesus went in and out among us, beginning from the baptism of John until the day when he was taken up from us, one of these men must become with us as a witness to his resurrection. And they put forward two, Joseph called Barsabas, who, all, who was also called Justice, and Matthias. And they prayed and said, Lord, You, Lord, you know the hearts of all. Show which one of these two you have chosen to take the place in this ministry and apostleship from which Judas turned aside to go to his own place. And they cast lots for them, and the lot fell on Matthias, and he was numbered with the eleven apostles. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. 
The epistle lesson comes from 1 Peter chapter 4, verses 12 through 19, and chapter 5, 6 through 11. Beloved, do not be surprised at the fiery trial when it comes upon you to test you, as though something strange were happening to you. But rejoice insofar as you share Christ's sufferings, that you may also rejoice and be glad when his glory is revealed. If you are insulted for the name of Christ, you are blessed, because the spirit of glory and of God rests upon you. But let none of you suffer as a murderer or a thief or an evildoer or as a meddler. Yet if, one, if anyone suffers as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in that name. For it is time for judgment to begin at the household of God. And if it begins with us, what will be the outcome for those who do not obey the gospel of God? And if the righteous is scarcely saved, what will become of the ungodly and the sinner? Therefore, let those who suffer according to God's will entrust their souls to a faithful creator while doing good. Humble yourselves, therefore, under the mighty hand of God, so that at the proper time he may exalt you, casting all your anxieties on him because he cares for you. Be sober-minded, be watchful. Your adversary, the devil, prowls around like a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. Resist him, firm in your faith, knowing that the same kinds of suffering are being experienced by your brotherhood throughout the world. And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. To him be the dominion forever and ever. Amen. Amen. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks, Thanks be to God. God. Please rise for the reading of the Holy Gospel. Hallelujah. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. Hallelujah. I will not leave you as orphans. I will come to you. Hallelujah. The Holy Gospel this morning according to St. John, the 17th chapter. Glory to you, O Lord. When Jesus had spoken these words, he lifted his eyes to heaven and said, Father, the hour has come. Glorify your Son that the Son may glorify you. Since you have given him authority over all flesh to give eternal life to all whom you have given him. And this is eternal life, that they know you, the only true God, and Jesus Christ, whom you have sent. I glorify you on earth, having accomplished the work that you gave me to do. And now, Father, glorify me in your own presence with the glory that I had with you before the world existed. I have manifested your name to the people whom you gave me out of the world. Yours they were, and you gave them to me as they have kept your word. Now they know that everything that you have given me is from you, for I have given them the words that you gave me, and they have received them and have come to know in the truth that I've came that I came from you. And they have believed that you sent me. I am praying for them. I'm not praying for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. All mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. And I am no longer in the world, but they are in the world. And I am coming to you. Holy Father, keep them in your name which you have given me, that they may be one, even as we are one. This is the gospel of the Lord. Praise, Praise to you, O Christ. Christ. You may be seated as we continue with a quick little children's message. Good morning. How are you? Good morning. Nice to see you guys. We're missing one. Is your brother skipping church? He's what? Oh, he's playing sports. Well, I hope he wins. 
Hey, so I want to talk to you a little bit about the lesson we just read. This is a prayer that Jesus prayed. And I think it's really important that we understand something that's really important about that prayer. They call that the high priestly prayer that Jesus spoke. And Jesus was praying to his father, God. And you know, in that prayer, you know who he's praying for? Who do you think he's praying for? He's praying for the disciples, but he's praying for somebody else too. Do you know that Jesus was praying for each one of you? Hmm. Even before you were born, even back when Jesus was still alive, Jesus knew that you were going to come in the world and he was praying to God that God would protect and lead you and guide you and make you come to a relationship, a oneness with Jesus, just like Jesus is one with God. That's pretty amazing, isn't it? But if you know, if you really think about that, it's pretty important, isn't it? Because, you know, as we talk about church and we talk about, you know, learning about the Bible and all that other stuff, that brings us closer to Jesus, doesn't it? Yeah. And that's how we kind of become one with Jesus is through what the Bible teaches us. And if we become one with Jesus through the, the, what the Bible teaches us, does that make us become maybe one with the Father too? What do you think? Say yes. Yes, that's true. We are. We do become more and one with the Father. But there's other ways we become one with Jesus and the Father too. Remember you guys were all baptized? Yeah. That's how you became one with the Father. And as you get older, soon... Some of you will actually learn how about the catechism and you'll start to partake in the Lord's Supper. We receive the forgiveness of sins there too. When you truly eat Jesus' body and blood, that's another way we get connected with Jesus, right? Along with, with uh, the word when you come to church. You hear me speak to you about Jesus. That's how we become connected with Jesus. Jesus wants us to be with him all the time, right? So we should thank Jesus for that, shouldn't we? Can you pray with me? Can you hold your hands and pray? Congregation, please pray too. Dear Jesus, Dear Jesus thank, you thank you for making us one with you and the Father. We know that you love us and we love you too. And Jesus, we pray. Amen. Because that's the truth, isn't it? All right, thanks for coming up. You guys can go back to your seats now. And we continue with singing. Thank you.
grace, mercy, and peace be to you from our Father and our Lord, Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen. Let us pray. Spirit of God, we just ask that you would pour yourself amongst us, that you would lead us to help us understand what you offer and what you give. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. So this morning, the text for meditation is called Rich in Christ grace. So we're going to hear a lot from 1 Peter today. But to start us off, I'm going to start from 1 Peter chapter 5, verse 10, where Peter writes, And after you have suffered a little while, the God of all grace, who has called you to his eternal glory in Christ, will himself restore, confirm, strengthen, and establish you. So it might seem a little bit of an oxymoron that I have this title. This is glory and uh, the grace of Christ, and we start off with suffering. But there's a purpose for that. And as I was thinking through this, you know, and I was reading and looking at the text, there is sometimes a purpose for that. There is a purpose for that. So if you look back when, when Peter, and even back into the book of Acts, when all this new church building was happening... The Christian church and the Christians in Rome were actually suffering. They're actually suffering from being Christians. And that's where we read in Acts about this, this fiery trial that's going on. And this trial was basically, you know, all the problems that the church was trying to get through based on their new form, faith and religion. And it was it was pretty tough. And if you look back at the scripture lesson, they're talking about slander that was going on against the new Christians, the ridicule, and the disloyalty potentially to the state of Rome. So it's really kind of interesting. So if you look at it in the contents of the day, it's kind of like you have this new Christian church. Uh, let's just look at it this way. Here you have this Lutheran church that actually is being persecuted by everybody in the community. The other churches. And not only that, you know, they're being watched and they're being persecuted by the local government itself. So if you think about it in the contents of the new church, think about what Nero had going on, how he persecuted the church. So there was persecution going on. What about in the contents today for us in our church? So what types of trials do we face today? Now, you know, you could go all different directions with this, right? We face all different kinds of trials. I mean, I don't think, at least in the contents of this congregation, we don't suffer the trials and the sufferings of martyrism, you know, like some of the early church leaders did. But we still suffer some of those other problems, right? Slander. You know, maybe it's a different thing. Maybe there's something going on in your life that makes you suffer. It could be, you know, problems maybe with your health. It could be problems within your family. But if you really think about it, the reality of it is, is we all kind of suffer, don't we? It's just all a fact of life in the sinful condition that we live in. So what do we do with that? How do we manage that? What's the purpose? If you look in Romans 8, this is what Paul writes. And we know that those who love God, all things work together for good. Did you capture that? It didn't say some things. It said all things. All things work together for God's good. Now, obviously, when we're suffering, we probably don't equate that very well, do we? When I suffer, man, all of a sudden I go off in one direction or the other, and I'm like a loose cannon. I mean, you know, Fran's got to kind of settle me down and say, whoa, you got to take it, well, slow down, you know, take a minute, think through this. You know, but that's the emotion. That's who we are. That's who we are as humans. But Paul understood suffering. And he said it all works to the glory of God. All things. So if you think about it, there is a purpose for trials and suffering. In our lives as, and in a church, do you think so? Do you think there's really a purpose? Is there a purpose that we go through this? Sometimes I talk about walking in a quagmire, you know, just living this, this mixed up, challenging world. Sometimes 
you need to think, and uh, I didn't come up with this. I actually read this uh, from a professor at one of the sins, but he took looked at suffering and trials as texture. Think about texture. So let me give you an example. When I was a younger man, I was, you know, into cars and trucks and stuff. And I mean, we didn't have any money. I didn't have any money. So you had to do everything yourself. So we kind of got kind of good about painting cars. And, you know, I never did actually paint, but I was really good at all the prep work. Taping, sanding. And, you know, you got to sand that surface to give it texture so that paint will stick. Right? So sometimes I think that suffering creates texture in our lives so that God's grace has some place to stick. Think about that a little bit. So, you know, God's grace abounds in sufferings and trials. Do you believe that? If we have faith, if we pour it out to God and allow him to change and take care of our situations... His grace can abound, can it? I truly believe it can. It did in my life. It took a long time. It was a slow process, but it's still abounding. God reinvents our sufferings. Think about that one. Can God reinvent our sufferings? Yeah. He reinvented Paul's sufferings that we'll talk about in a minute in order to make something good come out of Paul's ministry. What about in the church? You know, sufferings, I'll give you an example. All the congregations that I've been associated with, when they go into a vacancy and they don't have a pastor, it can be a hard, challenging time. But they come together as a church through that. The ECE board, trying to go through and find somebody that's capable of running that director for the daycare. It's hard work. It takes a lot of time and it can be challenging. Another form of suffering that we go through to further God's kingdom. All those together can actually be a situation where God can take and reinvent that suffering to his good and his glory. We just need to allow him to do it. When we suffer, we all need the rich, rich grace of God. So interestingly and perhaps quite slowly, as we suffer, we realize that suffering textures our lives so that we can be more supple. We can be more aware of God's graceful presence in our lives. It's kind of like, you know, trial by fire as, you know, a blacksmith or a you know, take gold and they refine it, as Scripture speaks. And through that, we discover God's sovereignty is not merely, it's not merely a mechanical rule of a remote God sitting up there in heaven someplace. No. But the power of God is present in our suffering that it will transform both us and our suffering. I see that a lot in my ministry. I see that a lot with people that are ailing and getting close to death. I mean, you could have terminal cancer, but God has transformed that suffering into a blessing. Because what it does is it brings them closer into a relationship with God. They're a lot more in tune, a lot more receptive to understand that God is in control and we're not. And that everything works through him. And we can't maneuver or get out of these types of situations. And at some point in time, they just give it to God and said, your will be done. Hard to do, especially for us humans when we want to be in control. We find new or perhaps more nuanced capabilities for our sufferings to sense the goodness of God in places where we previously would have missed it. How should we view suffering and trial in the lives as Christians? How should we look at this? Our true richness of grace lies in Christ Jesus. That's the only way that we can fathom and make it work. We can't rely on ourselves. We can't rely on friends, neighbors, family. It doesn't change the suffering. It doesn't change the emotion. It doesn't change how we react. Only Jesus can mold and, and change that. Paul's thorn. If you think about Paul after uh, his uh, conversion, 
thereafter, he was given what Paul calls a thorn. Remember Paul's thorn? And through that thorn, he speaks to God and asks him to remove that thorn. A lot of people, if you read the commentaries, they were thinking that Paul was getting a little bit too, a little bit too excited about his new ministry and the Lord needed to humble him. And he speaks about the messenger that was Satan that came. And he prayed. Now this all happened probably about 15 years after Paul's conversion. So this has been going on for a while. And Paul's praying and praying, take this away from me. Take this away from me. And what did God tell him? God spoke to him and said, he says, my grace is sufficient for you. I am made strong in your weakness. So how can God be strong in our weakness? Well, in Paul's case, he came to realize that all power, all strength, everything given to him came from his father, God. Even in his suffering with his thorn, he still loved and glorified God as, as his father. That's what gave glory back to God. He didn't give up. He didn't say, that's it. He didn't throw in the towel and says, I'm quitting. He just kept moving. I'd like to say, put his head down and just kept right on moving. Kept right on trucking. If you look in 1 Peter 2.20, for it says here, it says, for what credit is there if you sin? If when you, if when you, if when you sin and are harshly treated, you endure it with, uh, with uh, patience. But if you do it, but if you, but if when you do what is right and suffer for it, patiently endure it, this finds favor with God. So in other words, I mean, you know, you're going to have suffering as a result of just life circumstances. Peter says and teaches the congregation, you know, if you suffer for Christ's sake, you'll be blessed. You should endure it. But if you really think about it, it's all reality. It's just a fact of life. It's something that just we need to, to kind of learn and deal with. And again, in Peter, 1 Peter 3, 14, it says, but even if you should suffer for the sake of righteousness, in other words, if you're suffering for God's sakes, you are blessed. And do not fear their intimidation and do not be troubled. Peter's speaking now again, suffering against the church and against us as Christians. We talked about that before. That's happened to me and it's probably going to happen to you at some point in time. But we should endure that suffering out of respect of Christ. Christ suffered for us. And again, in 1 Peter 4, 16, it says, But if anyone suffers as Christians, he is not to be ashamed, but is to glorify God in his name. Have you ever glorified God in your suffering? Have you ever glorified God in, in, in your suffering? Remember what Paul talked about? All things work together for good. Giving glory to God and suffering is a hard thing to do. But at some point in time, God can use that suffering as a tool for us. Or maybe as a teaching tool. Maybe it's a situation where maybe he can bring us closer to a person in need. I had a situation with that this weekend on Friday at the daycare. A good friend of mine, his, his son, had a problem. Went into a seizure. I mean, I got the call at home. Panicked, worried. Had his son at, at, at the hospital. Unresponsive. You know, went there. I mean, he was a train wreck. And it you know, affected me too. Just from the perspective that, you know, I love him and his family. So, you know, even as part of his suffering, I call it collateral suffering. I was suffering too because I love them. And I minister to them. God's got this. Now, do we know how it's going to turn out? We don't. But all we can do is have faith that the Lord has this and controls this suffering not only in his lives, but in the lives of the ones that we love to. God has a plan in all this. So how does this apply to the life of the Christian? So again here, Paul writes in 2 Corinthians 12, Therefore, in order to keep me from becoming conceited, remember his thorn? I was given a thorn in my flesh, a messenger of Satan to torment me. Three times I pleaded with the Lord to take it away from me. But the Lord said to me, my grace is sufficient for you, for my power is made perfect in your weakness. This affliction gave Paul, that was given to Paul, was a gift. Paul said that affliction was a gift for him given. And you can read about that in Romans 8, 28. 
So in Romans 5, 1, we read, Therefore, since we have been justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. Through him, we have also obtained access by faith into the grace in which we stand. And we rejoice in hope of the glory of God. Not only that, but we rejoice in our suffering, knowing that suffering produces endurance. And endurance produces character. And character produces hope. And hope does not put us to shame because God's love has been poured into our hearts through the Holy Spirit who has been given to each one of us. So then what is our true richness of grace? For while we were still weak, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will scarcely die for a righteous person, though perhaps a good person one would dare to even die. But God showed his love for us in that while we were still sinners, Christ died for us. Since therefore we have now been justified by the blood, much more shall we be saved by him from the wrath of God. For if while we were still enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more. Now that we are reconciled, shall we be saved by his life? And more than that, we also rejoice in God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom we have now received reconciliation. So what are they? Here they are. For while we were still weak, Christ died for the ungodly. He died for us. That we may now be justified, be saved, be made just in front of our Father. That's what Christ has done for us. We have now been reconciled to God. We have been made his people and he loves us. We are saved by Christ's life and his death and his resurrection. So we also rejoice in God. So yes, we will suffer. But I think the contents of the message this morning is keep it in thought and contents based on what Jesus teaches his people. The scripture is loaded with ideas and objects and lessons, objects for us to see what God calls us and how we can manage our lives through suffering. Because we will suffer until that time when Christ comes and calls us home. But we should rejoice in our suffering and give praise to God that through those trials and those sufferings, God will make us his people. All this we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I would ask the congregation now to please rise. As we confess our faith in the words of the Nicene Creed. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and all things visible and invisible, and in one Lord Jesus Christ, the only begotten Son of God, begotten of his Father before all worlds, God of God, light of light, very God of very God, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father, by whom all things were made, whom for us men and for our salvation came down from heaven, and was incarnate by the Holy Spirit of the Virgin Mary, and was made man. And he was crucified also for us under Pontius Pilate. He suffered and was buried. The third day he rose again according to the scriptures, and ascended into heaven, and sits at the right hand of the Father. And he will come again with glory to judge both the living and the dead, whose kingdom will have no end. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Lord and giver of life, who proceeds from the Father and the Son, who with the Father and the Son together is worshipped and glorified, who spoke by the prophets. And I believe in one holy Christian and apostolic church. I acknowledge one baptism for the remission of sins. And I look for the resurrection of the dead and the life of the world to come. Amen. Let us pray for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and all people according to their needs. We pray with a boldness and confidence because we know he hears our prayers because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Lord Jesus, you are the Lord of the church. Watch over all who lead your people. Shape them to be men and women after God's own heart. Fill them with your word and sacraments and guide them to walk in their ways. We pray for our synod president, Matthew Harris, also our district president, Paul Linderman, our regional vice president, Steve, and our circuit visitor, Mark, 
and the servants of our congregation. Lead them as they lead us, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, Jesus, we pray for all who are suffering trials because of their Christian faith. Comfort them and lead them to rejoice as their share in, our, in your sufferings. That your glory is revealed because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Holy Father, we grieve the division in our families, communities, and world, and especially in your church. Keep all your people in your name, which you have given in the waters of baptism, and lead us to the unity we'll experience fully with you in your kingdom, because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. Oh, great physician. Build up the brokenhearted and heal those who are suffering in heart, soul, strength, and mind. We pray this day for those who are grieving and ask you to give them comfort as they mourn. We pray this day for those who are suffering from illness. Especially we pray for Weston and his family. We pray for Roy, Jim, Jeannie, Stetson, Greg, Katie, Miranda, Hazley, Rindy, Elida, Vicki, Klaus, Ray, Judy, Cindy, Helen, Carol. And we also pray for Lana at the passing, for Lana for healing, for Lana for the passing and her family and also Tom for his dad that you give him healing. We ask that you heal all those that need healing and serve those who need care and comfort from passing according to your good and gracious will, because Christ is risen. Yes. Holy Father, we also pray that you'd be with the ECE board as they continue to search for a candidate to support the ministry of the daycare. We pray that you'd be with the leaders on, on the board itself, uh, that you give them wisdom and, and peace and comfort to continue to, 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 to look and, and discuss what needs to be done there. We just pray that you be with them. We also pray that you would be with the staff, especially after the circumstances of, of Friday, that you give them peace and comfort. We just thank you for, for all that they give, the love that they give to those children and to the parents. We just pray that you would keep them uh, safe, help them to continue in the challenges that they have over there, and continue to serve both the kids and the family. Because Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. Hallelujah. We trust, O oh Lord, in your great mercy to hear and answer us. Through Jesus Christ, our risen Savior and Lord. Amen. You may be seated as we continue with the gathering of the offering. rise.
The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. And thanks and praise. It is truly good, right, and salutary that we should in every time and every place thank you, our God and our Creator, and as given your one and only Son to suffer and die for the sins of the world, before rising victorious on the third day, appearing before his disciples, before ascending into heaven, to lead us to the glory that awaits us. Therefore, with Mary Magdalene, Peter, and John, and with the whole witnesses of the resurrection, with angels and archangels, and with all the company of heaven, we laud to magnify your glorious name, evermore praising you and singing. Holy, 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 God has Father of faithfulness and protector of wisdom. As you marched before the people of Israel, you sent your son, Jesus, to march before us, suffering and dying for the sins of the world. Bring us together to your Lord's table today as we eat his, this bread and drink this cup, proclaiming the Lord's death until he comes. To you alone, our Father, be all glory, honor, and worship with the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, on the night when he is betrayed, he took the bread and after giving thanks, he broke it and he gave it to his disciples and said, take and eat. This is my body given to you for the remission of all of your sins. After the same manner also, he took the cup and after he had supped, he gave it to his disciples and said, drink from it, all of you. This is my, the blood of, my, of the covenant given to you for the forgiveness of all your sins. Do this as often as you eat and drink it in remembrance of me. As often as we eat this bread and drink this cup, we proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Amen. Come, Lord Jesus. O Lord Jesus Christ, only Son of the Father, in giving us your body and blood to eat and drink, you lead us to remember and confess your holy cross and passion, your blessed death, your rest in the tomb, your resurrection from the dead, your ascension into heaven, and your coming for the final judgment. So remember us in your kingdom and teach us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory, forever and ever. Amen. May the peace of the Lord be with you always. Amen.
rise.
we thank you, Jesus, for gathering us at your table on this oasis for the parched and the weary souls. Strengthen us as we face fiery trials and suffering so that your glory may be revealed. For you live and rule with the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Receive the blessing of the Lord. Now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with his favor and give you his peace. Amen. You may be seated as we sing the closing hymn.
Christ has risen. He is risen indeed. As we trace through this, this world, it seems like I'm suffering all the time. But remember, you know, God suffered too. Christ has risen for us and our promises to carry us through it. That's our promises that he gives to us. So depart in the peace of God. Go and serve the Lord. Thank you for coming.